So good morning, and this is our last week of Understanding Mark 21. This week, we're going to be talking about um, the 00x and fixed fields and copy cataloging. Uh, before we do that, are there any questions about the homework? I do want to spend a little bit of time going over subject headings. Uh, there were a lot of questions. Uh, but before I start, uh, does anyone have any questions about subject headings and the assignment? So it doesn't look like there are any questions. I think overall, you guys. Uh, everyone seems to kind of grasp the basic concept of subject headings and how subject headings work. But there's, um, I just want to go over the homework a little bit just to make sure that we are all clear. So let me pull that up here. And I didn't get the answers. Oops, that was not what I wanted. Um, I didn't get the answers posted until this morning. I had a few assignments that came in late. And if you're just joining us, we're going to go over the homework a little bit before we get into today's discussion. If I can pull it over there. Let's see. There we go. OK. So it looks like uh, everyone, like I said, everyone gets the basics of subject headings. Um, and subject headings are, I mean, there's a lot there to learn. There's a lot of rules, and we just covered the basis, the basics. So what I really noticed with the first um, question, the first answer was, and this is something I do a lot when I'm using um, a thesaurus that isn't normally like just the regular old Library of Congress is I forget to change um, the uh, the indicator here, that second indicator from a zero to a one to show I'm using a different thesaurus. And then uh, the other thing um, I really noticed was there seemed to be some confusion about when to do a 600 and we do 600s when we're working a lot with biographies or autobiographies. You use that when you're talking about like the subject, like with the Abraham Lincoln, or not the Abraham, but Mary Todd Lincoln book. You would do a 100 for, um, let me pull that up here. For, you would do a 600 for Abraham and his wife Mary not a 100. We only use that 100 when we have um, like authors or uh, illustrators or people who are involved in the creation of the resource. And then, you know, with the 600, it's, it's aboutness. It's more descriptive. And then that 700 is used if it's like um, an editor or an illustrator or co-authors. And the other thing was um, the 610 here with the United States Army Air Corps. And I know I said last week that geographic terms like United States get, um, they go into the 651 because that's where we put those, those geographic headings. But when there's uh, other bodies attached to it, when it's got like a government agency, then it goes into the 610 uh, in this case, because we're talking about the United States Army Air Corps or if the United States Army Air Corps had co-authored this book, that would go into a 710. So does that all make sense to everyone? Okay, good, good. I'm glad to hear that.
And again, you know, later on, if you're confused or you're working on something and you're confused, you're always more than welcome to email me and ask me questions. And so if there aren't any other questions or comments about subject headings and the homework, we'll move on to talking about um, the 00x and the fixed fields. And then if we have time, we will talk about copy cataloging a little bit. And there is an assignment for this week. There's technically two assignments. One is uh, just a short um, like what we've been doing. And then I do have an evaluation uh, for everyone to fill out, but that's not due right away. And we'll talk about that more at the end of class. Well, let me get out of here and go to the 00x and the fixed fields. And you, fixed fields were like Greek to me. Okay, that's from Rachel. <laughs> you know, the fixed fields, those, I had a really hard time learning those at first. That was something that was, well, like everything with cataloging, just completely alien and foreign and uh, had no clue. But we will work through this. And if there will, and if there are questions, just let me know as we go, and I'll address them as, like I said, as we go. So the first one we're going to talk about, we'll, we'll talk about the 00x fields before we get on to those fixed fields. And the 00x are where we enter a lot of the kind of numbers, like ISBN numbers, um, Library of Congress control numbers, and so you see like the, the 010 field is where we uh, we enter that Library of Congress control number. And there's a couple of different um, styles that you may see. They um, after 2000, they went ahead and they they changed them a little bit. And you can see where you'll find them in the CIP data here. And and I don't work with these fields much because like I do a lot of cataloging with state publications. And so you wouldn't see those kinds of things in things that have been self-published or um, you know a lot of special collections like state publications or older materials. And then we have the 020, which I think we're all familiar with, which is that ISBN number. And um, they're pretty easy to find. They're on the title page Versa. And they can have more than one. And you can see multiple ISBNs in records. You'll see like one for the ebook and the paperback, the hardback. Sometimes it gets a little confusing there. Uh, personally, I kind of ignore them. It's just, to me, not super important. But again, that's kind of catalogers' judgment. And it depends on your policies for your library. You know, a lot of a lot of people search by ISBN, like a lot of librarians I know do. And that's not my favorite way of searching because it can you can pull up multiple titles with the same ISBN and or multiple formats, and it just it gets really confusing. But again, that's just me. Uh, we have a 028, which is the publisher. And again, this is not something I work with a lot. Um, we've got the indicators here and that tell us a little bit about what you'll find in that field. And then we have the 041 field. And this is one um, that I do use when we have um, things that are cataloged in another language. And okay, and it looks like I have a question here. Is the information in the A and the H subfields reversed from what it should be? I.e., isn't the original language language English? Um, you know, this is one I always have issues with because I don't use it very often, and so I will double check it right now. Um, Let's go ahead and take a look and see. And I'm just going to the Library of Congress mark. Well, that's for the codes. Let's actually go into, let's get back, and let's actually go here to the OCLC page. And let's take a look at, let's see. 
you can see there's a lot more codes here that you can enter into those fields. Again, it depends on what you're working with and what kind of materials you have. So here we go, the 041, the language code. Let's take a look. Um, okay, what do we have here? We have, get back to where I was. Okay, so the A is in English and the H is in Klingon. And Okay, so this is this seems a little weird. And I understand why you're asking the question, Mary, because the A is the language code of text soundtrack or separate title. And the H is the language code of the original. So in this case, because, okay, I haven't actually looked at the Klingon Hamlet. I pulled this from Amazon because I wanted to do something really cool. I assumed that it's in, based on the title and the fact that if you look really closely, there's some Klingon here on the, the, the title page or the, t the cover of the book, um, that it's originally in Klingon and then translated into English. I think when I looked at the description in Amazon, it said it's text in Klingon and English on facing pages. So the, does that make sense? I know it's a little counterintuitive that you put the translation code first and then the, the, the code of the original language second, but that's just kind of one of those quirky cataloging things that we do. So if that makes sense to everyone, or at least to Mary, weird, since Hamlet was first written in English. Well, okay, I see your point, Mary, because it was originally published in English, but we're working with the item we have in hand. And so this version of Hamlet is in Klingon. And so that record needs to reflect that, not that it was originally published in English, but this this item here is published in Klingon and with English translations. Now, if we were working with the original Hamlet and it had like, I guess French, maybe, I don't know. I've never thought about this too closely, but I do I do understand the point you're making. Does that make sense to everyone? That we're in this case, in most cases, we're working with the item we have in hand and what it is, that it's in, it's in Klingon. So I'm not getting any responses. Either we're all really confused, all right, I've already put everyone to sleep or we're all cool. Okay. At least one person's good. Okay. Mary, does that make sense to you? So if there aren't any other questions about the 041 field, we'll go on to the next one. I can live with it, but it still doesn't make sense. Yeah, I know. It's and this is probably not the best example. <laughs> and um cuz it's kind of a clean on joke that the clean or it's a Star Trek joke that um Shakespeare is best in its original Klingon, but we all know that Shakespeare was English and he wrote in English and not Klingon. So we'll move on to the 043 field, which, and you'll see this in a lot of records, and you probably have noticed it. It's 
it indicates the geographic area associated with the subject. It's not it's not based on the place of publication, but it's based on like what it's about. And oh, okay, I think when I look at the reading here, I maybe didn't I need to go back and re-edit this. So I do apologize and I will correct this and get an updated version posted right after class. Uh, but there is a list of codes. Let's go and click on it. And we'll do um, the name sequence. And Rachel wants to know if we have to have a 043. Not necessarily. I, I don't always enter it in. It's, you know, it's something some people will go in and enter. It kind of, again, it's kind of catalogers judgment. Um, because to me, there's other ways to indicate in the record what the geographic location is, for example, um, with some of the homework we did this last week where, you know, we had headings that, you know, said Alaska, subject headings, Alaska and Montana. In my opinion, that's enough. You don't really need to go any more into any more detail there. But again, this is more for the computer and not so much for catalogers. So let's pull up, let's see what the code is for Nebraska. And let's see, Nebraska, here we are, right in front of me. Let me highlight that. So we would enter into the 043 just as it appears here in um, dash US, which tells us it's the United States, and then NB, which tells us it's Nebraska. And you can see that there are uh, all sorts of codes here for all the countries in the world. And I think even, let me, I think even for some regions, if you're working with, um, for example, like, uh, well, let's just look them up and see. Let's see. Um, I was thinking like the Great, like the Great Barrier Reef actually has its own code. Or the Great Lakes and the Great Plains. It looks like the Great Plains has one as well, and the Great Rift Valley. And let's get back to the reading here. And let's see, we were talking about geographic codes here. And so um, it says here at the N is for North America and the US is for United States. And so if you're working with something that's in Europe, you're gonna see a different code there. And then uh, we get to the 050 and the 082 fields. And this is where you would record your call number. And a lot of this is more if you're doing original cataloging and not so much copy cataloging. Uh, if you're working with records that were created by the Library of Congress, you can see like um, where they've assigned their number and they would put that in the 050. And then again, those indicators will tell you uh, if there's a one that um, it's not an LC, but if it, there's a zero, it is. And that second indicator will tell you, you know, who assigned it, if it was uh, Library of Congress or another agency. Uh, for things I, I create here at um, the Library Commission, I would do, I would use like a four in um, my second indicator because we're not the Library of Congress. And you can find those examples. You can find that information, you know, in, uh, again, your CIP data. And I think we talked about this uh, in the first couple of weeks. I had some questions about, like, the call numbers here. And, um, and Diane, I will get to your question in a minute. So um, that you, depending on your collection, 
you don't always necessarily need to agree with what's in um, the 050, like for Library of Congress, or if there's a Dewey number already assigned. You know, depending on your collection, you don't necessarily need to use what's here. And so Diane's asking, I'm so confused. I thought I was supposed to use the 090 rather than the 050. And that's a good question. Uh, I've used both the 050 and the 09, the 050 and the 090. I think I said that correctly. That's a lot of numbers. And so let's go into here. We'll go back to the Library of Cong or back to o the OCLC page. Um, I think a lot of that might be catalogers' judgment. I've never quite understood the difference there. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, the 090 is a locally assigned LC type call number. And let's just pull this up. And they're based on the Library of Congress schedule, but assigned locally. And this is, it's a local field. So it's something you wouldn't necessarily see like in the master record um, from OCLC, but you can add it in to your local record. And I think it has a line in here that says, if you are transcribing LC copy, use field 050 for the LC assigned number. And then it says, Um, and then, so it's not clear to me, like, what the difference is, other than that 090 is what's going to show up in your local record, and not necessarily the master record. The 050 will show up. It's like the 050... is um, if you assign a Library of Congress classification number according to the LC class schedules, prefer 050. So what's the difference between the 090 and the 092? Well, that's a really good question, Rachel, and I will get to it in a minute. <laughs> okay, good. So I think what this is saying, um, Diane, is that if you're creating a number that's an LC number that's based on the LC classification schedule, but maybe doesn't adhere to it strictly, you would use the 090. And okay, yeah. And if you're using if you're creating using a number that adheres exactly to, then you would use the 050. Okay? Does that make sense? So, okay, good. Now we'll answer Rachel's question, which as a refresher, what's the difference between the 090 and the 092? Okay, well, let's look at the 092. There's a lot of fields here I'm not familiar with, and, um, and, and that's okay. And there's going to be a lot of fields that you're not familiar with when you're working on catalog records, and you may never use them. Uh, like I said at the very beginning, Nobody expects you to remember all of this or understand all of this because I sure as heck don't always. And sometimes you kind of hear me fumbling for an answer because I'm trying to think through it and talk it, talk myself through it. So <laughs> anyway, so the 092, back to Rachel's question, is for a locally assigned Dewey call number. We have different fields for Dewey and LC. And why? I don't really know. It seems like you could do different, you could use different indicators, but I didn't create Mark. I just play with it. So, does that answer your question? And it looks like it does, Rachel. Okay, good. So, let's go back to. Where are we here? Okay, here we are. And so um, here I do talk a little bit about how like an an LC number like appears 
um, in the CIP and how it gets broken out here, how they do the cuttering. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail there. And it looks like Catherine is saying our consortium uses the 092, the 094, and the 099 for individual sites. And is that for like each library uses, um, it varies depending on the library, what field you use there. Is that what you're saying, Catherine? Yes, each library system. And and I've heard of other libraries doing uh, similar because it does look like that that 099 is a local free text. Again, this is a local field that you're going to see on your local records, not necessarily in the master record. And you can see where you can you can code this um, your indicators, whether it's LC like or D or Dewey like or your local classification scheme. Uh, Mark does give you a lot of. Um, a lot of options there for how you code uh, your local data because it is it is important to have that in there and so that brings us to the Dewey decimal and that goes in that 082 field and again this is for there's two different fields for the Dewey Decimal, and it kind of depends on what you're doing. You can use that 082, and that's where if you're bringing a record in, you'll see it, like if it was assigned by LC or someone else, um, you'll see it there in that 082. And then if you're doing kind of a more um, like your own kind of local thing or you're using an older version of Dewey, um, some libraries do you can go ahead and enter that into another field. Oh, and this brings us to the 099, which is what Catherine was talking about. Um, for these kind of free text, or some people, you know, if you have a DVD collection, um, you might put DVD uh, at the beginning of the call number, kind of as a signal that it's a DVD and not a book, and it belongs with your DVDs if that's how you shelf things. And now we have the fixed fields, which are Greek to some of us. So before we get started on the fixed fields, are there any questions about <laughs> what I just talked about with the, uh, the 00x fields? Again, I know I just threw a ton of information at you. So if there aren't any questions, we'll go on to the fixed fields. And these, these do take a while, I think, to really kind of understand. And there, we talked about this in, the, in week one, that it's, these are really important because they can, they tell the computer how to display the information, what information is there. And if your catalog, if you do things with icons, you know, that's where a lot of that information gets pulled from. It are these from these fields. And they can also help limit searching when you use the advanced search fields. Uh, I've got an example here from OCLC where you can limit by like language here and that's getting pulled from the, the language field or from audience. Again, if you've coded for audience or format. And again, you don't have to go ahead and um, you don't have to memorize any of this. I mean, it's all there. If you work with enough, um, if you work like with books a lot, eventually you do kind of learn them or CDs or DVDs. And I got a comment here uh, that we do have a lot of questions, but we're just trying to absorb the information. <laughs> and that's okay. That That's okay. Yes, you know, sometimes you just got to, you know, soak it up and absorb it and think about it. And then uh, later on, you know, maybe some questions will come. But since I can't see your faces, I like to check in and just make sure that we all sort of understand what's going on. And um, I've pulled records here from Connection. <laughs> 
and um i'm sorry I, i'm giggling at, at rachel's comment so she she's um made a, a frowny face and said that's her face right now <laughs> sorry it made me giggle <laughs> anyway um and so within connection they're broken down and i don't know how this looks in your individual um library systems but this is what it looks like for me uh, when I'm working in connection, which is where I do most of my original cataloging. And these are the leader, which come at the very beginning of the MARC record there. And then the rest is the fixed fields. But I think a lot of people, myself included, kind of refer to all of this as the fixed fields. And the fixed fields you see in a record, they, they vary depending on the format you're working with. If you're working with like a DVD or a CD, you'll see um, thing, you'll see things that are, are really specific to that. And what are the the numbers? The 005, okay. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, so these are, um, they're numbered by the position of the character in this long string here. And I, I don't think of the fixed fields this way. I think of them as form, content, illustration, but I did include the numbers here because there are some systems like I can pull it up and we use Mandarin and I can on the back end, um, it pulls it up by the numbers along with the title. So I just wanted you guys to be aware of that, that they have names, but they're also numbered depending and that number corresponds to where it's in the long string of numbers that the computer sees. And so regardless of what format you're working with, you'll see the date um, when it's created, um, publication, date publication status. Uh, if you're working like with a serial or a um, something that has multiple volumes, you'll see multiple dates. The country where it was published, not to be confused with the um, 043, I'm guessing, uh, which is where the resource is set. Uh, what language? And then the source, which is what agency or library created the original catalog record. And what you'll see will vary a little bit. And because of that, you know, you always want to make sure you have the right format because uh, like an OCLC connection, when you choose your format, uh, it automatically pops up with the fixed fields for that format. Like if you're cataloging a DVD, it won't show you fixed fields that are, are applicable only to books. And so here are the fixed fields or the elements that you'll see specifically for books. And you don't necessarily have to fill in all of these. But if um, the more you can fill in, um, the more complete your record is. And it, 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 there's more options there in terms of searching, like the advanced searching. Uh, and again, it kind of just depends on, on your um, what cataloging system you use and okay glad to hear that that some people are starting to kind of get this yeah it's and where are these numbers located okay so like the um the element numbers here Diane is that what you mean yes okay so we don't necessarily see these like in a connection record. And let me just pull up. Let me go into connection and pull up something for you guys.
Oh, and it logged me in as Bonnie. That's okay. I'll pretend to be Bonnie for a few minutes. So, okay. So we're, we've created an original record for this item for windbreaks for fruit and vegetable crops. Wow, that sounds really exciting, really interesting. And these are the fixed fields, and this is how they appear to us when we're working in the connection client. And you can see the numbers aren't here. It's the actual names of these fields. And that's because most of us probably can't remember the numbers. As you've noticed, I can barely remember um, mark fields and have to always go look them up. <laughs> And you can see where um, our format here is book. But if I were to change it um, to, let's do visual materials, which is a fancy way of saying movies, then they change. And you'll see different ones like um, TMAT. And in connection, you can click on them, and it will tell you what that means. You don't have to remember what. That abbreviation is. In this case, it's type of visual material. Okay, does that make sense to everyone? Okay, good, good. Or if I just made an even bigger muddle of things for some of you. And it's okay if I did. Well, I mean, it's not okay if I did. It's so I don't know what I'm trying to say here. So. <laughs> But what about the numbers? Well, so what about the numbers, Diane? <laughs> uh, sometimes you, you know, where would you find them? Okay, so OCLC has chosen not to show them. Oh, okay, and Lori says, actually, I've seen this format and copy cataloging. This is what we are talking about. Correct. It is, Lori. And a lot of this, uh, I know I present a lot of this information as if you are creating an original record. A lot of this is um, when I'm copy cataloging, uh, I do go in and verify that these do match up because um, – you know, people mistype. Let me go back to book here. Okay. Um, you know, and some of it is very subjective, like with illustration. You know, it says it says colored illustrations here in the 300. And this is obviously an AACR2 record. So I would probably go and, you know, when I had the item in front of me, I would probably go look at the item and actually see what types of illustrations, because you can click on this and it takes you to the OCLC page and tells you what the codes are. So if you've got something and you're not really sure what's going on there or what these codes are, again, you don't have to remember. You just get to go to OCLC and look. But yeah, Diane, back to your point, OCLC isn't doesn't use the numbers. And, and I don't know why that is. Let me get out of here. Um, Let's just get out of here. And let me pull up. I'm going to pull up a Mandarin record. Good. I'm glad to hear you're getting it, Diane. Let me see. Okay, and Catherine's saying her local system does not use the numbers either. Yeah, it just depends. So that's why I did go ahead, and and Mandarin's not letting me get into it right now. So we'll just we'll move on. Um, that's why I included both here, is because some systems, like our system does go in and use those numbers, and some don't. And I think in OCLC, let me go ahead. I think... It does go ahead. It does list um, that char like that character number and the field, um, how it's relative in the record itself. But again, I because my mind doesn't do well with numbers, I 
don't think of them this way. I, I think of those fields by their names. So uh, we have the visual materials here. Um, those fixed fields are things like running time, target audience, and a lot of this, you'll, you're probably thinking, well, we've already entered this into the record, and, and yeah, um, what we've entered in is more for the display, and like I said, these fields are more, these fields are about um, the, what the computer is seeing, what the con computer is interpreting, and how the, con and the computer pulls from here, you know, to make like icons or however your displays work. And so we've got another example here from OCLC Connection. And you can see, again, this is a visual material, and you can see um, when it was first entered into the, into the OCLC, when it was, someone came in and updated it with replaced, and, you know, what language it's in, um, what country, and XX just means it didn't, excuse me, it didn't say which country. It didn't give anything. You know, when it was first published, which is, um, and you can tell looking at DTST, which is like distribution, um, that it's only been published once. And that it's um, monographic, um, the type is that it's a movie. And it's the same thing for um, like if you're working with a sound recording. And with some of these, they get a little more complicated uh, because there are various types of sound recordings. And it gives you a lot of options, you know, what type of music or um, is it a part of something? And we'll, we can go into a little bit more detail on these fields. And this one is for like the date. What kind of date is it? And that's important, you know, if you're working with a book, um, you know, is it a single date or is it questionable or unknown? And how you code that, you know, influences how it, how it displays. And then we also have, I touched on this just a few seconds ago, the, the country or place of publication. And again, we have a list that we pull from and you don't have to remember these. And so for something published in Chicago, you would look up the code for Illinois. It's by state or country. And it will tell you too also, if, you're, if something's super specific, like um, for some of these locations in India, if you look it up, it will say, oh, hey, you got to use India. And you can also note in these fields, uh, you know, um, is there, was there a bibliography included? Was there an index? Um, literary form, language. And again, you know, we do we do note a lot of this in multiple places in the record, but some of this, like for the, um, like the 300 and the 546, you know, this is what the public sees. This is the front end, whereas they don't necessarily see this stuff up here, the fixed fields. That's more for the back end. So, are there any questions? before I touch on um, the final chapter, which we'll talk about copy cataloging a little bit. And then if there's time, we'll talk about the assignment. And <laughs> And so uh, let me bring up copy cataloging. We'll go through that. And I know I'm really rushing through this because I'm trying to, you know, get a lot of material in this week. So copy cataloging. So original cataloging is when you have to you create a new record. There's no other record that fits the item you have in hand. And copy cataloging is there is a record and you have found it. You've brought it into your system. 
And sometimes it means you're correcting errors or adding or deleting fields according to your local practices. Uh, sometimes you want to enhance that record. You want to add things in that you, you know, think will improve it. Um, for example, if it's just a very general record, you might decide you want to go in and add like a contents note or a description, um, like a summary. Or um, depending on your library, you may want to go in and add, you know, some of those 500 fields about like has it won any awards, uh, particularly if it's won, you know, some of the Nebraska awards like the Golden Sour. And you can get these records, um, records for free, depending on how you're set up. You know, I think a lot of you get them through your vendor. You can go ahead and um, you can go and get them from the Library of Congress. And this brings us just to their catalog. So you can go in and look at what they have. And through the catalog of Library and Archives in Canada, you can use, um, there are some converters here, and we'll talk about those in a few seconds. And it is important that when you are looking for records, that you find what matches in your, what you have in hand. And the easy way to do this is you, you look for ways to eliminate records. And that's where a lot of, all of this information comes from, is, even though it seems like I, you know, you probably feel like I don't really need to know this much to copy catalog. It's important to, I think, understand how, where we pull the information from in these fields. So that way you can better match what's out there. And so I use Charlotte's Web as an example, and you can pull up, I mean, there's a lot of records for Charlotte's Web out there, as you can imagine. So some really easy ways to um, narrow down is you can search by ISBN. And like I said earlier, you, you need to be careful because sometimes you'll pull up something that has like, they're not always unique for whatever reason. And so I quite often use like language and publisher and publication date to narrow my choices. And you can see here, all of those codes that go into the zero, zero, the fixed fields, they're all showing up right here. So if what I have in hand is English, then I'm automatically going to want to get rid of like these DUT because that's Dutch. And publisher is another good way uh, to eliminate things. And then here's our publication date right here. And another good thing to do, uh, another good way to kind of narrow down your records is to make sure it matches the format. And so, for example, if you've got like a hardback copy of something um, or a paperback, you don't necessarily want to bring in a record for an electronic resource or a movie, depending on what it is, because that information is just not going to match up very well. You know, you're not you're not really doing anyone any favors by doing that. Um, because, for example, like in an electronic resource, you're not necessarily going to list like page numbers or um, it just it complicates searching, I think. And so before RDA, if you were working in a utility like Connection and um, with OCLC, you could just look at the the GMD, that subfield H here, and you knew right away, oh, hey, electronic resource, that's not what I want. And having the 33X fields has made that a little more complicated because as you can see, they're not showing up here. You know, I have no way of knowing the format really without going in and actually looking at the record. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that, Lori, that you are on board with matching the correct record and you understand. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, I know. I know some of you have really struggled with some of this. Like there's a lot of details and I've tried to encourage you not to get too bogged down in the details. Kind of look more at the big picture. And another thing to look at is this um, this encoding level. That's what ELVL stands for is encoding. And for example, a record that has a level eight, uh, that's a pre-pub record. 
and which had originally contained that CIP data. And sometimes it's not always accurate because it was created before the resource was published and things change. And also they don't always have like the 300 isn't always filled in, for example. So if you were to use a record like this, you would want to make sure you change that 300 and get rid of that 263, which is the pre, which is the expected publication date. And that brings us to local fields. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, here at the um, Library Commission, we use the 599 for, um, this just tells us where it is, um, when we got it. Um, in this case, it, it's a book. It's in kind of our, what we call our LC collection, because we catalog it using, we assign LC call numbers. And that we got it um, in 2014 on February 6th. So these can be really useful. Um, for local practices. And we did the same thing in the, 850, uh, the 852. This just tells us down here um, that we own it. It's in the LC collection. Here's our call number, um, the barcode, and then which copy it is. And this brings us to, you know, editing these records. Um, for some of you, you can use the, the Mark Edit tool. And this just allows you to go in if you've got a huge amount of records um, to go in and it tells you how it all works and that you can update it. Uh, you can just go ahead and rather than going through like 100 records and changing each of those records one by one, like if you need to go in and add the 33X fields and they're all books, uh, you can set this up so it does it for you. And I don't use this a lot. I don't have a lot of experience with it. Go back to the bottom here. And there are also some sources of free mark records. And there used to be one, a tool that converted Amazon records to mark, but Amazon decided they didn't like libraries doing that. But there's one, um, the internet movie database. You can go into here and enter like the movie title or um, if there's an IMDB number, and let's just see what happens when I do that. And so it pulls up um, some of the data here. And I, again, I'm not very familiar with these tools because I don't, I don't use them very often. but I did want to make you aware um, what's out there and what's available. And so that brings us to the end. Are there any questions before I go to the assignment? We have about 10 minutes left. So we do have uh, an assignment for um, the information that we just talked about today. And I'll open that up. Let's see here. And as you can see, it's really brief. Um, just three, three titles here. And all, um, all I want you to do is just create the proper 0xx fields. Um, for any information that can be found on these items. So you're basically <laughs> just the answers should all pretty much be here on these slides. Let's see. Um, I think one of them was the Triceratops book. So um, let's see. So you're only going to include whatever information is here. Um, you know, we've got the call numbers listed. We have the ISBN. Uh, we have this number here. Um, so it's whatever you see here and just how, how is it going to appear in a mark record? Okay. Is that easy enough? I don't use the 082 field much, but is it okay to use the single quote when it shows up in a Dewey number and CIP information? Um, like the quote mark you see in a Dewey call number, 
like you have a bunch of numbers, and then you have a quote mark, and then you have a bunch of more numbers. Let me see if I can find an example here. Um, okay. So what Mary is talking about is there's a little quote right here. And I don't think you need to use I don't think you need to use that. And um that just basically says, hey, if you want to, you can cut the number off here. You can just use 636.1. And um I think, like I said, I don't work a lot with CIP data. Um, I'm usually assigning my own or, but is it wrong to use the quote is what Mary's asking. You know, I don't think it is. And let's, let me get rid of this. Uh, you know, a lot of times when I'm not sure about something, um, I go here. I go and I look for examples. And let's pull up. This is the 082, which is for Dewey numbers. And let's see here. And this is just kind of giving us examples of how things appear and how they get transcribed. And it looks like rather than using that quote, what you'll use is a slash. The slash means the same thing. But I'm sure you can probably use that quote um, and, and be cool. Does that make sense? Okay, good. And then there is a class evaluation, and it's not due right away. And let's pull that up here. Okay, so it's just very brief. Um, be honest. And um, I will say this is the first time I've done this. Normally, I teach face-to-face. And so this has been a real learning experience for me, uh, as well as you guys. I've got a lot of ideas about what I'm going to do differently the next time I teach this class. And you don't need to put your names on here or your library. Um, um, I, I firmly believe in anonymous evaluations and that people should be able to be honest and, and not fear that the instructor or the professor is going to hold it against them. Does that does that make sense for everyone? So this isn't due right away. And whenever um, you have a chance to get this in to me, uh, I've really enjoyed working with you guys. And I've learned a lot about uh, teaching Mark. And um, it can't be anonymous if you send email. That's a really good point, Mary. And um, my point is, I will print them out and I'll probably just put them in a pile and and um like I won't be able to connect it to your email cuz I'll probably set them aside for a few weeks and that way um it more or less will be anonymous and you can sign your name if you want I just wanted to give you guys that option uh that you know you can be anonymous and and so I have I've really enjoyed working with you guys uh, I've learned a lot about Mark. There's a lot of things I don't know. And so I really have enjoyed your questions. Uh, later this summer, probably early fall sometime, uh, I'm going to try and put together a class on DVDs and potentially CDs. It depends on how much information is there. And I'm going to offer that through Moodle. It's going to be organized a little bit differently. So hopefully, um, I'll see some of you there too. If not, that's okay. And like I keep saying, if you've got questions, you can email me. I'm always here to answer your questions. And in regards to the assignment that is due next week, we obviously are not meeting, so we really won't have a chance to discuss the assignment. But I will, again, put up the answers 
and explanations. And um, for some of you who have submitted questions with the assignment, you know, indicated you know you're a little confused or you're not sure, I will I will go ahead and respond to you individually as well. So, so thank you. And for CE credit, who do we email? I believe there's a form on our website. And let me pull that up. You guys are very kind. And for those of you, we are at 11. Uh, if you do need to leave, you can leave um, on our website. Let's see if we can find this here. Um, certification. Submit CE credits. And so there's a form here where you can go ahead and you put in your activity, your library name, um, who's submitting it, your date, the date, and the number of hours. This might be for board members. That's for the board. Okay, ignore that form. Sorry about that, guys. Um, let's see. Here we go. This applies towards our cataloging certificate, right? Do we have to submit a form or that? Um, Rachel, that's a really good question. And I do have forms for some of you um, for the cataloging certificate. And let me check with our CE people. And um, I think you can do it either way. Um, you can always email um, Linda. Um, let me find her email here. That's not what I wanted. You know, this website is really confusing sometimes. Um, what am I looking for? Okay, contact us. You can come in here and let's see. Linda Babcock, she's our assistant and you can always email Linda, our staff assistant in um, library development. She does, she handles a lot of the CE, and you can always email her for clarification. And do we all qualify for a cataloging certificate? That's a good question, Lori. I don't know, but I will go ahead and research that and let you know. And um, we'll go from there. And you ha okay, Rachel's saying she had to sign up. So yes, there is an actual form on our website. Let me let me see if I can find it. Um, a, uh, there's an application form. So this one's just for the regular old librarian. Oh, okay. Rachel got a confirmation. Oh, you never got a confirmation that we received. Yes. Okay. I let me pull that out really quick. I have those. Okay, Rachel, I don't see it in the ones I have here, but I will check with Linda Babcock and see what's going on there and let you know. And Lori, there is a form here. I can never find it. Um... Let's see, there's actually an easier way to do this. Okay. Um, here's me. Well, that actually takes you to my email. Let me, services. And we have cataloging services and there's the cataloging certificate program. So this kind of gives you a rundown of it and you have to you do have to print and complete the application form and send it to me and then i go talk to linda and i figure out what i need to do okay it might be under the education tab too thank you Alyssa. education yeah that's always a good place yep hey you're right there it is see you guys are smarter than me and Rachel wants to know, should I resubmit? Rachel, let me check first and just make sure. Um, this is the first time I've done a class, so I'm not really sure what to do. And Lori, okay, so if I continue with more for the cataloging certificate, you will. You will go ahead and apply, yeah. 
but do make sure you know those of you who did take this for CE I uh, you know do make sure you go in and you fill out the form and you let us know that you did do this and that you did complete um, the homework and you were here for six of the seven uh, live sessions and yeah that's it so thank you once again thank you so much and for bearing with me as I learn this and um, hopefully I'll hear from some of you if you have questions hopefully I'll see some of you in another class usually the instructor submits names or participants for their CE credit okay I will talk to Linda and um, see what I need to do there okay and so in a couple of weeks um, you can come in and check your how many credits you have so do make sure you check and if you don't see them there um, email me email Linda and we will get it sorted out okay I'm glad you guys enjoyed it and thank you you guys are great on that note I'm gonna go ahead and turn us off and the recording will be on YouTube and um, next week's answers will be posted next week and if you've got questions let me know <laughs>